Hello everyone. Sorry, I gotta turn a little fan off. I'm getting chilly. Okay, so this was a donated request from Muhammad um, Ishmael, but I was I was saying Ismail. Yep. So before we get started, you can donate to the channel through the thanks button. You don't have to. All donations are appreciated. You can subscribe to the channel. I got 7,411 videos. That's not true, but I have a good amount. And then click the bell. If you don't want to do any of that, click the thumbs up. And that was my stomach. I apologize. I'm running out of iced tea. <laughs> this is... Um, I got maybe one more of those. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it's Monday now. I basically have been drinking so much iced tea. It's delicious. So, I got some popcorn on hand, and we're going to get into this video right now. They could have incorporated the best of both worlds. And they could have taken this and then made sure that some new system is done. But by shutting themselves off completely, what happened? SubhanAllah, in 1500, 1600, look at the, you can clearly see. Uh, yeah, in the, it's a very simple chart some, some modern researcher has done. They're trying to show Europe and Islam and the Muslim world. And the, Europe is clearly at the bottom, Islam is clearly at the top. Around 1550 is when the two meet. Right? By 1600, the decline here begins and the rise there begins there. Right? And by 1800, which is when colonialism starts, another huge turn goes down. Right? By eight, let's look at 1800. By 1800, the average Muslim has never read a printed book. The average Muslim has never seen a printed book because there's still the penalty of death. Right? But by 1800, the average European, I mean, Charles Dickens is around this time, right? Look at where we are by 1800 versus where Islamic lands are. And some people, Muslim and non-Muslim, have said, and this is simplistic, but wallahi, at one level I agree. Some people have said, if you had to blame the decline of the Muslims on one reason, it would be the printing press. And there's an element of truth to this. Because with the printing press comes what? Knowledge. And with knowledge comes what? Power. Every type of power. Economic power, political power, religious power, every type of power. The printing press was so strong it destroyed the Catholic Church, right? The printing press was so strong it split Christianity into two. I mean, again, it's not a coincidence that Martin Luther had a printing press and he printed his own Bible, right? It's not a coincidence. All of this, the, 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 the Renaissance and then the Reformation, these are the two main things that have formed the pre modern world. Both of these are linked to the printing press. Right? So with the printing press comes power. And this power shook the foundations of Europe and made it a whole new world as it is now. We as Muslims shut ourselves off because of all of these reasons. And that's one of the reasons. Of course, there are also uh, spiritual reasons as well. Now, to conclude here, and again, I mean, the purpose of this was just to give you one, one lesson, right? The printing press and the, and the paper, just to see the difference, right? The paper and the printing press really shows psyche. And again, I reiterate for those who came late, I began this lecture by saying the rise and then the fall of the Muslims has clearly two elements to it. Number one, spiritual, let's not ignore that, very important, right? Iman has an immense role to play, and the printing press without Iman is also useless, right? But let's be honest here, number two is also the Dunya, this world, knowing what this world is and embracing modernity even as you preserve your heritage. And unfortunately the Muslims in their complacency, in their whatever, they refuse to adapt to modernity. So modernity was shoved onto them and we're still in suffering from this phase. We still haven't fully adopted to modernity and I don't think we ever will but that is a whole uh, different point. Um, and I just want to conclude by uh, pointing out that you know, the main lesson that we learn from all of this, the main lesson that we learn, uh, again, before I conclude, all these things coming back to me, even the Sahaba, subhanAllah, the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, they were not in terms of worldly education at the pinnacle. Do you agree with me? Right? Worldly education. Astaghfirullah, don't ever misquote me. Iman and everything, the highest. 
They are the best of our ummah. Please, nobody ever misquote me. But I'm talking about in terms of the civilizational uh, areas of judgment, right? Of architecture, of literature. The Sahaba and Tabi'un had a different had a different understanding, but they were willing to embrace and they were willing to adopt. And Umar ibn Khattab and others, when they conquered other lands, they had no problems that adopting to the local practices. Do you know that for the first 50 years of Islam, all of the Dawaween and all of the, 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 the government documents were written in local languages by scribes that were not Muslims because the Sahaba understood we don't know how to run an empire. We might have conquered the Byzantine or the Sassanids, but we don't know how to conquer, rule over you know, 100 million square miles. You understand this point? They knew this and they embraced this change. Many of the famous viziers of the early Abbasids and the early Umayyads were non-Muslims. And they didn't have a problem with that because they knew that we don't know yet. It was only in the late Umayyad time that the Umayyads finally made Arabic the national language. And they finally made their own currency. And they did. Before this time, the Sahaba had no problem adopting Roman currency, Persian currency, adopting Roman practices when it was not anything to do with the religion. And this is the inquisitiveness, the open mindedness that I'm talking about. They see paper, they see how useful it is, they embrace it, they change the world. A thousand years later, the printing press comes and they said, no, 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 shut the world off. Right? And we're still suffering from this type of mentality now. Alhamdulillah, things are changing. Muslim mindsets are now becoming more open-minded. But we have two extremes, once again. We have these two extremes, going back to the beginning as well. The first extreme is to be so narrow-minded in the religion as to avoid any type of change whatsoever. Whatever, Whatever our father and grandfather did, that is Islam with a capital I. And you all know of these types of people. You all know of these types of fatwas, right? To this day, there are mosques in North America that do not allow women in their prayer spaces, correct? Because mosques back home don't have women. To this day, there are mosques in North America where the khutbah is given in some type of broken pseudo-Arabic that nobody in the audience understands. Why? Because we, find, we found our forefathers doing this, we're not going to change. Even if nobody understands, we're going to take a book and read this khutbah, and I don't care if nobody understands. Isn't this true? Right? You all know, and this is true, it's not a, it's not a myth. When the microphone was introduced, they said, we're not going to have the microphone in the masjid. You know, this is true. When the radio and television was introduced, this is all evil, we're not going to have it. Right? Well known. But you cannot fight world changes. You need to embrace them. So we have that ossified type of mindset. We're not going to change anything of the religion. Everything is the same. Pass it down. It's true we have the opposite extreme as well. And this is the extreme. They call themselves progressives, right? Everything goes. Whatever public society says should also be a part of Islam. No gender segregation at all. Same-sex marriages. This, not, Whatever is popular should also be made into Islam. You, these are two extremes, right? As usual, the truth is in the middle. And this is no doubt a difficult field. And it requires scholarship and an open-mindedness. Unfortunately, and I'll be frank here because inshallah I am of the scholarly class, clergy class, many of our fellow scholars are not open-minded enough. Many of the open-minded intellectuals are not scholarly enough and not Islamic enough. And this, was, this is the problem that we're happening. Many of our scholars don't want that side. Many of the reformists don't want this side. Right? And so there's this huge clash and tension that we have between these two ranks of people, as usual. The and neither side, sorry, it's really good popcorn. Neither side is willing to give an inch to the other side, or a centimeter, pick your measurement, to the other side, because then they feel like they've lost something instead of coming on uh, coming to common ground and saying we can both agree here now let's discuss this okay uh, okay how about this uh, how about this okay yeah, yeah yeah instead of finding that common ground they instantly look at each other as arch enemies and i i think of politics in america at the same time
truth is somewhere in the middle. Scholars who are open-minded should lead the change. They should tell us where the line is to be drawn. And they should tell us where uh, uh, something should be allowed. Final point, you all will say, how is it possible that the scholars did not approve of the printing press? Let me give you a controversial example that inshallah ta'ala, I hope to implement someday. But I don't want any of you to implement. If I were to do this now, many of you would object. Right? But this is an example that I have thought about for many years, and I'm very firm, inshallah, about, but please don't do so without some scholarly backing. Uh, I'm just giving you as a theoretical example. In my humble opinion, not only should the khutbah be given in English, not only should we use the microphone, we should also have PowerPoints for the khutbah. We should have PowerPoints. Where, where the khatib is, there should be two blank walls in the khutbah time. I should be clicking as I go along. And you should be following along with me because the purpose of the khutbah is what? Is to pay attention and get it, right? And one of the best ways to get this information is basically by visual. You all know by visual you learn more. What is wrong with having a PowerPoint during the khutbah? Think about it, right? Now, for many of you, it's the same thing. That, and wallah, if I were to do this, I would get a huge backlash from people all over the world. A'udhu billah, bid'ah, kafir. You know this. I'm, you know this is true, right? You know this is true. Right? There'll be automatic khutbah once. <laughs> people are going to say, if you open the printing press, this will happen. They're going to say this as well. That if you're going to allow PowerPoint, what next? Just have a, a, a video for the khatib then. They're going to say that. But no, we say the scholar is going to draw the line. We need a live khatib in presence, right? The PowerPoint has to be conforming to these conditions. We have, but the scholar should lead the change, right? And inshallah, when we build our MIC center, Dr. Bisha, I will suggest and petition the board that we take the lead in this, inshallah. And we have PowerPoints already installed and ready for the khatib to be using while he's giving the khutbah. I don't know if the, I don't know if the board's going to approve or not, right? But... But why not, now? why not now? Because we don't have a nice wall for it. That's why you'll fix that. Inshallah. <laughs> but I will be the the Ibrahim Pasha who's writing the letter, and I'm saying, open your minds, be realistic here. You know, what I'm saying we need this type. Now, this is a type of change. I guarantee you that somebody's gonna do it first. If we don't do it, somebody's gonna do it, right? And if somebody does it without conditions, without scholarship, yani we don't want it to go too far. The scholar should lead the change with the proper Islamic conditions, right? And that's where the bottom point that I want all of you to really go away with is be open-minded about your religion and about the modern world. Understand the limitations of the clergy class and of the intellectuals and progressives. Realize that Allah sent this religion down to be applied at every time and every place and every location and Allah allowed for some change to occur. And had he not allowed for that change, Islam would never have spread from Alaska to China, from Australia, although it wouldn't have spread if Allah had not allowed for some change, right? And so inshallah ta'ala, we hope that by this small history of paper and the print, shed some light about this. I ask Allah's refuge if I made any mistake or if I said anything that offended anybody. I know these are difficult topics for many of us to... Uh, to swallow. But inshallah, I hope that as we continue along, we will educate the ummah more and more about some of the pitfalls that we face so that we don't have to face them again. I know I went over time, just two, three minutes of questions, and inshallah, we'll pray Salat al Isha. Yes. Uh, two points. First of all, there is a message in Damascus, uh, the Sheikh gives this PowerPoint. And not this, but also he prints the football or the main points. So it gives them to the The printing is much easier to do. There is PowerPoint. So he's saying there is in Damascus. Khalas. So we have precedent. Khalas. So the question is, uh, in Quran, uh, there is like ayat, uh, kitab Yes. The word kitab, is it, like you said, uh, kitab was only invented by the Arabs or the Muslims as a book that we know it, like with uh, paper and the cover? The binding. The binding. The word kitab in Quran, does it mean that? Or what does it mean? No, the structure of the kitab was not mentioned in the book, in the Quran, it doesn't mention. I am saying the structure of the modern book, to have two flaps as a cover, to have a sewn binding, and then to have another flap on the side, which these days we don't have that flap. You know what I'm talking about? The, the Arabs here would know, even Pakistanis, you have this flap of the Quran, right? In the old days, they had a flap on both sides. One of them was full, and the other was something you could use. That This structure was invented by the Muslims 8th, 9th century. Before this, uh, the, the Prophet never had a bound Qur'an. Uh, and the earliest Qur'an 
the, the Quran of Abu Bakr was called a mushaf. And a mushaf, it was called a mushaf because a mushaf means a collection of papers, not bound. A collection of sahifa, suhuf, right? A mushaf was an, a term used for the first Quran because it was not bound. So the structure of a bound book with covers was not known to the Sahaba. I guess the question is, what is the word kitab? Yeah, the book of kitab. Kitab, as we know it now, it means a book. No, but I said what... Yeah, I keep looking over at all my books. <laughs> I'm just, I'm looking at all of them, and I'm just thinking about how far the technology come has come from Muslim, you know, book binding to... To today. Huh. What did the Muslims do? The binding and the covers. So it's a, a it's a, a book doesn't have to be with bindings and with covers or with a flap. You have a collection of papers. This is a book, right? But you didn't have the bound book. This is what the Muslims uh, invented later on. Not a collection of of scrolls or a collection of yani even the mushaf of abu bakr how was it i told you we have a copy of the quran that's huge it's not bound it's papers and you just pick up one paper put it here and look at the other paper that was called a kitab right but it wasn't bound on one side this is the difference okay sisters any questions go ahead you, you talked about paper and the printing press and how important it was arguably the advent of the internet is as important arguably indeed question that I have is, what is your assessment, briefly, of how the Muslims are harnessing that technology and where are we lacking in how we're handling the internet? Uh, firstly, an announcement. There's a Mercury license plate 910FK3 uh, that light is left on. It's not on fire. It's that the light is left on, your battery is going to die out. So there's a Mercury, Milan. Uh, the internet. This is another major, major technological advancement of our times. Not just the internet, but also, uh, but also the, the television, the media, satellite channels. All of this, clearly, the Muslims have not utilized it to the level it should. But at least because there is no government control over all Muslim lands, individual Muslims have embraced the idea. Right? Still, though, uh, Muslim satellite channels are way behind. Look at here in America. We still don't have a single successful satellite channel even though there is I mean sad to say Arabic rap channels Pakistani music channels right Indian Bollywood video channels right but we don't have a successful Islamic channel in all of North America we have attempts but nothing that is professional and to that level same applies for the internet there are many good attempts here and there and overall alhamdulillah I mean it's I would say the internet because there's individual efforts and you don't need millions of dollars an average person can dedicate a good amount of time and produce a good website but still the internet can be utilized more but this is where again the job is for individuals with the passion the expertise the technical know-how to get involved and to then utilize the modern printing presses to bring about the change okay the Arab Spring is almost entirely related to the internet the Arab Spring is all the result of Facebook and Twitter yes without Facebook there could not have been the Arab Spring yes Good. The question is about when initially when the, uh, it was when it was called Haram to have a printing press. And we understand the reason given that uh, they don't want to do the power and all that. But what was the religious reasoning given? The religious reasoning given was twofold. Number one, the scholars wanted their power, which was uh, some legitimacy that we don't want to open up knowledge. Number two, they said that it's not dignified for the Quran to be printed or Islamic books to be printed you should it should be why not because we're used to this but for them a Muslim scribe ala tahara you know with wudu he writes the Quran you know he feels religious while he's doing it you know if you were to do this what are you gonna do a kafir can just turn the switch on and all the Quran is being printed it feels sacrilegious right so they felt a sense of and I'm not saying this is completely incorrect. There is a sense of a righteous Muslim writing the Quran with his hand and getting reward for that. Religious books, then overall religious books. That's why they allowed eventually in 1726, they said what? Basically, kafir books okay, Islamic books not okay. Right? 
Because we don't want Islamic books to be printed with the printing press. Okay? Oh, we're going a bit too late. I don't want to delay Isha for. Quick question. Like, um, I mean, we, you know, like you said, Islam did rule the world. You know, and uh, with, with so many scholars, so many smart people, how did nobody predict that, hey, if we don't have books, these guys, these, you know, Christian guys, Jewish Jew guys, they're reading all these books. Some people did predict it, but too late. As I said, Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Mutarifik in, in 1720, he's the one who said that unless we do something, they're going to outpace us. Way, you see what I'm saying? You're, you're saying way down here and there. But again, Akhi, I agree with you now, but hindsight is 2020, right? Looking back, it's so easy to say, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? Believe me, if somebody were to ask you now, how come to this day so many Muslim lands have tyrannical regimes? How come it took so long for the Arab Spring? You know, And I'm saying Arabs, how about my own land of Pakistan and others? How come we're so backward in corruption? I mean, wake up, what's going on? Can't we say the same thing of our people? It, it is, so it's not, it's, well that's true, a lot of it does go back to the printing press issue, yeah, it's like, I mean, even today, you know, in, in a lot of those lands, I mean, I'm from Bosnia, but, you know, people don't read books, it's like what you hear, oh, I, you know, this guy told me this, and he's an expert, so he must know, you know, without checking, any of the information, that's what it is. That's what the yeah, it's true to say that Europe developed what we call the scientific mind of inquiry. It is generalization, but it's true to say that they, even in school, in this land, we are taught to question. You know, we're taught to, but in our lands, we're not taught. We're just taught to hear and obey the authorities and rulers. I mean, being generic here, but there's an element of truth to this. Allahu yeah. alam. Just like, like with the PowerPoint, I'm an educator. I use PowerPoint every single day. I don't see what's wrong with that. Like, how I don't see what's wrong with it either. I can guarantee you, you I can guarantee you the first scholar in North America or in most... You're saying this is in Damascus, but it's not common, right? Yeah, just one. Yeah, I, yani the first person to make this public, he is going to face fatwas of uh, innovation, of this and that. I mean, believe me, I'm in that world. I know. I know this is going to happen, okay? So, uh, yani, inshallah, I'm hopeful MIC will, uh, will be brave, but it's up to the board of MIC. Again, we're just giving our advice from outside, you know, and doing this, inshallah. Huh. Yeah, I could listen to him discuss anything. I like the guy. Okay. I didn't speak a whole lot because I'm... I'm always just engaged in listening to him. <laughs> but yeah. His PowerPoint idea, that is interesting. Because yeah, that would get a lot of people from outside to become more engaged in um, in listening to him. Because I always, I, you know, the, the videos that I've done before, he does have those PowerPoint stuff like that. And it, it's a very interesting thing because then you can, he can, sh he can say something and then he'll show you a picture where it's like a graph and it'll show you maybe a timeline of something and, and you can absorb what he's saying. You, you can see the fact with it. It's interesting. All right. Well, I appreciate this one and I'm going to go ahead and end it here. This is interesting. It was interesting. Okay, well, I'm going to end this one here. But until next time, have a good day, have a good night.